Hills meeting. We're here at 6 o'clock. We're starting here now. And everyone's here. We're getting started now. Of course, you're sure to be such human trafficking and drug smuggling. We got uh, little people here. We got food, blow a pig, and cabbage. We'll show you guys what's going on. Aloha, Aloha. Aloha. Aloha, everybody. Hey. Couple years. It's been a couple years. Aloha. 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 Aloha.
um, have HPD have meaningful actions when enforcing um, homeless and also in a humane way. Um, the next slide I have, um, I think I went to the next one. Yeah, oh, there we go. The next one is the Kahale Bill, and this was proposed last year as well. This came out of Kuhono Owai, and you probably heard the great news that um, James Koshiba, who is going to be the new homeless coordinator under the Green Administration. And, and what this bill does is it really um, it, it looks at HPHA, our public housing, and authorizes them to, to build Kauhale, similar to what we've done in the Yuga area here in Waianae. Um, and one of the important aspects of this measure is that it looks at the emergency proclamations that the governor issued um, in various times to address homelessness, which relaxed a lot of the permitting and zoning laws, which make it difficult to quickly put up these kinds of projects and to really also think outside the box. So whether it's manufactured homes, trailer homes, um, micro units, um, these kind of things can be made a lot easier under the Paul Poly Bill. Um, it sets up a um, advisory board and uh, of course appropriates funds. And then finally, sanctioned campsites. Um, and now this is something that the Wainaimoku Bukuna Council um, and many other groups have looked at. Looking at legislation from areas like Oregon, Texas, and Colorado, who all have similar problems to what we see in our state, where our, our public areas are taken over by those who are um, less fortunate. And so what they've done is ban um, camping, illegal camping, in public parks and other public areas, but at the same time created sanctioned campsites in other areas. And so um, one of the areas, very controversial I know, but that the Kukuna Council is looking at others as well, is Sewers Beach, as an example. Um, it's a place that is not in your homes. Um, it's near to the bus station, it's near to this comprehensive health center and the Wyoming Mental Health Center. Um, so it's, it's something that they're looking at discussing with the county and the state officials. Another area that I um, have talked to GHHL about is Mahehehe Ridge, which if you're not familiar, it's um, kind of in the Lua 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 Valley area. And there were 12 lots that were offered to beneficiaries. Only a few of them um, actually are inhabited now because it lacks infrastructure and it needs to be cleared. But perhaps this could be an area for beneficiaries um, to create a Kalkali, similar to the Dublin King's Landing and, and other places where um, they've got a right of entry that's gone on for quite many decades now. So those are some ideas I have. And this is also in your handout to create one. So with that, I will now pass the mic. Either of you that are ready to go, good time. Okay. Wow. Aloha Kako. I want to thank everyone for joining us here today as we are preparing to go into 2023 legislative session. Um, I'm really excited to serve with Senator Shimabukuro as well as Representative Kila. I know we will be united in our front to serve our community and that's what we're all about, making sure that we have a united front so that when we go to the legislature, when we're amongst the 76 other legislators that we all can have the same voice and be a vessel for the community's needs and the resources that we deserve on ground by my goals. Uh, you know, today we are here again to listen to the community's ideas of bills that we could possibly introduce or resolutions that we can introduce. Uh, we really want to try to take your ideas and turn them into laws and, and things that can be put from pen to paper onto the governor's desk for his signature at the end of the 2023 legislative session. After this past election, uh, Speaker of the House Scott Saiki has appointed me Chairman of the Agriculture and Food Systems Committee. Yep. I'm very excited to use this position to help serve our community of Guyana. As we all know, this is the bread basket for a wall many years ago, and we want to see that return. And we know that our community can support these efforts, like Guyana, who is doing tremendous work in our community. Uh, and along those same lines, my goal is to 
promote uh, food production as well as promote sustainability for our food systems. Uh, we import 80 to 90 percent of all our foods, and that needs to change. The other thing is. Being the new ad chair, I'm meeting with all of these stakeholders to try to get a grasp on where we're at with the agriculture industry in Hawaii. And a lot of people are struggling to survive, from my understanding, from all the people that I've talked to. So we want to make sure that we also put the resources and money to the Department of Agriculture so that we can support our local growers here and we can support the sustainability model that many of you have been talking about for years. My plan is also to make sure that we are partnering with community organizations, like I said, with Wine and Comp, all of Farms, Kahumana, uh, Oaina, all these different entities that I think if we all come together as a collective, we can really move mountains, and that's what I'm looking forward to as well. Uh, with that being said, we are excited to see all the possibilities that lie ahead. Uh, I think with the new administration, uh, in general, for our state, um, I have a positive outlook. Uh, in the past, we've had a lot of uh, disagreements with Governor Ine and how we were getting services to our community as the executive branch of our state. He's in charge, of, the governor is in charge of releasing funds, running the departments, and doing all these other day to day operations where we as legislators are passing bills, we get the funding, to get the support that the administration needs to execute on all these ideas. So again, moving into uh, this 2023 legislative session, we have a great relationship with Governor Green, as well as Rep, uh, Lieutenant Governor Lou, who I served in the legislature with for six years. So I'm excited to hopefully get the attention that we deserve for the needs that we have out here to make sure that we are getting uh, everything we we need to make sure our community is a thriving one. Again, I want to thank everyone for being here. I'm looking forward to again hearing all your voices and follow. Uh, oh. Hello, everybody. Hello. Thank you folks so much for being here. I am the newest member of our West Hawaii delegation. And I'm very grateful, but I, I cannot stand here without acknowledging my grandmother, my pupuna. Grandma! For any of you who know me, my grandma is the root of all that I do, my moral compass, my backbone, my support system. And so even when we're both a little under the weather, she's here with me. And so I'm very grateful for you, Grandma. I also cannot stand here without acknowledging former Representative Stacey and Eli, who really mentored me to come into this position. So I'm very grateful for her as well. I'm also grateful for you folks. You folks come out here time and time again to be with us. You know, I look in the room and I see old faces and new faces. I see the Salcedos, I see Heather, I see the Cianos, Alicia, this is the Binatan, my Dada Puli Kukuna Council, the Wainai Coast team. You folks are the reasons that we can succeed in some of the stuff that we do. So I'm grateful for the work that you folks do that may or may not be highlighted at the Capitol. So thank you folks as well. Have a great as a person. So the last month, we, so after election started everything, so it's been a transition. I only just got my office now. I've been working out of a conference room for the last month. But it really was transitioning everything that I believed in and then now putting it to something tangible. So I've been very blessed to sit on our finance committee in the house, which appropriates monies for the state budget. I sit on our housing committee where we will find hopefully tangible long-term solutions. And I have the privilege to be the Vice Chair for the House Committee on Transportation. So many of those issues are prevalent to this community. I will not be the one to say I have all the answers, but to be at the helm, at that table, to allow the conversations that need to happen, 
is super, super important. So I'm grateful for that. So I, I know we're only doing small introductions for now, we'll get more into it. But some of my priorities that I've been able to start going with so far. I'm going to look to the Chair of Agriculture to help me on the House side with this. This bill was introduced last year and died at the Governor. He vetoed it, but it's there. So when we talk about supporting our local farmers and our local industry, it's our tarot farmers. We import more tarot than we export. Tarot farmers, tarot farmers operate at a 30% loss every single year. So this bill would give out a tax exemption of the first $100,000 in profit to our tarot farmers to allow them to keep the money here in the money. So I'm hoping that we can get this bill passed super tangible. Now a bill that has come out that I'm drafting and I get huge pushback and I hope that you folks can help me on it. I'm modeling it after New York and LA. It's called the Mansion Tax. They implement a, a sales tax on the homes of over a, a million dollars in New York, five million in LA. I think the biggest thing that Hawaii residents talk about is the purchasing of homes of foreigners that come into Hawaii and they do nothing for our communities. So this would be, we don't have the number yet, but a conveyance tax issued on the sale of a home made starting at $3 million that would go into a revolving fund that sits and stays in here in Hawaii for Hawaii residents to get down payment assistance on their first homes. So yeah, I'm very excited about this bill. And I, I, I think my and Senator are the same page as me, but I definitely know we will face opposition. So once this bill comes out, and if I can get your folks support and testimony, if you want to talk more about this bill, I'm super excited. Another bill that stemmed from working with Mrs. Nabina Tabden in Mahili, what a lot of folks don't recognize here in West Oahu, when these communities were developed, the transfer of land did not occur to city state property. So where Mrs. Nabina Tabden lived, they actually live on a private road, and they are subject to the failure of their developers where they don't get the assistance on public infrastructure. So the bill that I'm writing right now would offer GDT tax monies that we revenue that we create revenue for would allow infrastructure improvements on private roads being necessary for repair to help the private roads like this to be and other structure in Hawaii. Hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> Another one would be a prison pipeline program. Knowing that we have folks who are incarcerated coming out of the prisons that have little to nothing, this would give a tax break incentive or a refund to employers who give preference and hire convicted felons. Um, another one that came up was increasing penalties and fines for drivers who drive without insurance. That affects a lot of us here at Hawaii and Coast. Time and time again, you see folks get into accidents and nobody is called accountable because the driver at fault did not carry insurance. So we're just trying to do a little bit more. And those are just some of the things that I have coming out of the pipeline for me. I really would like to also, if you folks think that's a good idea, I'd love to hear your folks talk story. We'll get more into some of the transportation stuff, but that is where I'm kind of at right now. I'm very grateful for you folks hanging out with us during Christmas week coming out on a Tuesday at 6 o'clock. And I also want to acknowledge and thank Representative Lama Sal from Waipahu and Brian from the Hawaii Farm Bureau because everybody tonight, please take home banana, tomato, and mango that they have gave us this evening. So that is all kind of for you all for us. So I'm grateful for them. But thank you guys again and I look forward to talking more with you all. So we're going to be discussing transportation uh, solutions and chips. Oh, who's first? That's right, Mona's first. So who wants to go first? You're going to ask the community. Okay, so. So, um, Senator, share your homeless solutions are heard here, and Cedric's 
to share his and then Darius, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. You know, homelessness has been an issue that I've seen all my life living here on the White Night Coast. Uh, whether driving past Miley Beach, driving past KL, we all know that this issue has been decades old. And, you know, I think there has been administrations in the past that have done a good job of managing our beaches and our parks, and mainly the city beaches and the parks. But I think where we're at now, uh, there are a lot of stipulations and issues with trying to do what's right and also trying to preserve the public spaces for our community at large. Uh, with the city side right now, from my understanding, Mayor Landjardi hasn't come out with any solid policies on addressing homelessness. And that was brought up, I think, at the last Puna Council meeting we had when Andrea presented to us about how that has created a situation where it's hard to enforce certain crimes and also having this revolving door continue. We all see these enforcements that occur on our beaches and things just get moved to the roadside and right back over to the next side. Uh, one of the ideas that I introduced when I first got elected was the bill called Ohana Zones. And I created that bill with the collaboration of Anti Tweeko and Puho Noa Owaina. And what I seen when I was the neighborhood board chair at the time, and Scott Morishige, as well as my predecessor, came out to say, let's enforce Wai'anae Bo Harbor. And for me, Knowing the revolving door, knowing that every time we do these enforcement, we're kicking cats down the road. If we don't have a plan in place to do this, then we shouldn't move on it until that happens. And when we were engaging in those conversations at the neighborhood board meeting, I was uh, a light came in my head and I said, why don't we make what they're doing legal? But also give them the support necessary to provide structured environments where they're not living necessarily in tents, but let's use modular units to try to house these folks. Uh, and what came a lot out of that was the Ohanazo bill. That was my first bill that passed. And six years later, seven years later, we reauthorizing that bill, providing 15 million to go to own projects like what HPD has set up at Kea Outreach Park. We're putting that into rapid rehousing programs as well as shelters. But the biggest thing that I feel is super important for us to get over this hurdle of the revolving door is providing stable housing units for low cost. And I think that what we, how we can do that is using Governor Green's proposal, which is basically the Ohana Zone Bill, which is creating these clusters of homes that are very affordable, low cost housing, low entry, and wrapping services around these individuals that have been chronically homeless or just became homeless. And a lot of it also has to do with the services that have been built out in the past. Right now, from my understanding, talking with our homeless care providers, homeless families aren't the issue now. It's the single uh, single individuals as well as couples who don't have any places to go because everything is structured before if you have a kid or basically trying to get the families in there, single moms with kids, all that kind of stuff. And I think that we have to, in order to address the homeless situation, that we have to look at the pocket of people that haven't been getting services because they're kind of overlooked. And I know there's this thought process of everybody's able to body, they should be able to go to work. We also know that there is uh, trauma, substance abuse issues, things that need to be addressed before people can make a transition into a more productive lifestyle. And then, so that's kind of where I'm at on this issue. I like Miley's idea about having parking lots that we can convert during the nighttime for individuals who live in cars like couples and so forth to be able to use that place while also getting uh, services. And the wraparound services we're talking about is getting their ID, getting their birth certificate, getting their social security card, um, getting them into workforce training programs, things that can uplift them and give them a leg up instead of a handout. We want to see people be able to progress and 
be supported with resources that we know is necessary in this community. So I know the conversation around this has been very mixed, but I think that if we all can come together and say that housing is a human right at this point, we need to provide this type of service so that we don't have to see the millions of dollars that also go to treating individuals who are on the streets all the time. The health outcomes for individuals who are homeless is outrageous in my opinion. 30 years uh, cut off their life expectancy when you're a homeless individual. So we need to think about that. On top of that, I'm off on this though. 34% uh, of all homeless in our community and across the state are native Hawaiian. It's probably a little bit more up on our side of the island because of course we have the largest native Hawaiian community, but across the state, the majority of our houseless individuals are native Hawaiian. So we have to do what our fiduciary duty is, is to serve the people and make sure we take care of them as well. Mahalo. I'd be lying if I said I have all the answers or we have all the answers because the homeless folks that are at I'm so sorry, I'm sick, so if my mask muffles the mic, I will try my best to enunciate more. The folks there are not the same folks that were at depots ripping off people across the street. So I understand that every pocket of our houses community is different. But West Oak, in our community, Point in Time Health, which happened last year, we documented 400 house unhoused folks here in our community. That was a number that was down, but Point in Time has always been somewhat of a misconception because not, we don't get to everybody, right? I am grateful that we were able to collaborate with the city to get folks out of depots because that was a beach that really a lot of folks in not fully utilize. Now, are they pushed more down out of depots? Yes. But are the families that are living in the Hawaiian homesteads across the street getting ripped off, feeling uncomfortable, having folks enter their properties? No. So we gotta look for sometimes the little light in the darkness of it all. I appreciate the work that Cedric and my and them are doing on, on this side of the community, and I appreciate what we'll continue to do on the Mahili Nanakuli side. But as Cedric said, it's the barriers to housing and acknowledging that sometimes, in you know, a we have to understand and respect the Hawaiian viewpoint that a, a four walls and a roof over our head is not sometimes traditional or inherent for how some folks live. When I was in Oregon attending college, what was a huge thing to help with the houseless population there was our faith community. So when I looked to the churches in Nanakuli, I worked closely with Pastor Alan Martinez, and he is right now underground helping the folks who just got wrecked by the weather. So sometimes I know it's easier to find frustration in the things that are happening on our coastline. But while I was sheltered in my house last night with just a little water coming to my window, my heart hurt for the folks across the street that got slammed. Do I know, does that make it right? No. But there are some things that we will never have to face that some of these folks do. I'm always a firm believer if we can put one dollar in into our houses community, they'll come back and give it to us in two. Because if these folks can find a way to be integrated into society, it only makes them a better person. So I look forward to now that Josh Green has appointed the new Scott Marshy, the director of homelessness, to help us on the guidance and relax some of these guidelines to get the housing. But back to the faith community and the parking the parking lots. What the faith community would do at night is they have service providers in the churches that would allow these parking lots to become not, I don't want to say safe zones, it's not the word I want to look for, but they're not in public spaces and the churches are doing more than just doing, the churches are doing more than just feeding. This was their chance to get to know their stories, they're working with social workers, 
because sometimes a, a meal is just not enough, but I am grateful for the meals that they do provide. So I was trying to work out the legalities behind what that would look like with my leg and having folks in the parking lot, I think is a good step forward to get folks off of our coastline. But I understand the frustration because we are the bar at the helm of Hawaii. We're working every single day. And I know when you when we're commuting from wherever we have to go for working, sometimes we see our coastline and it's have folks cluttering the area that can be frustrating. But I, I do want to share that we, myself, and the governor's team are more committed now than ever to finding those solutions. But we are not any better to not not hear things that you folks might have to suggest as well. So I hope you folks can kind of see our hearts and where we're at with that situation. And yeah, so thank you. Person, and what we're going to do is we're going to take a question from here in the room, and then alternate with a question from those online. So, if there's anyone here that would like to come up and. Hi, James. James Powell. Hold on. Oh, maybe what's that? Seth Jones, go first. Except. You know, I am here. <clears throat> My name is Seth Jones. I'm a little bit of Valley. We're going to do something about wildfires. I've lost over seven hundred thousand dollars in crops, and I don't know. My neighbors have lost millions of dollars, but we have to coordinate the fire department the efforts. They did, the Colorado Fire Department can't take care of everything. In California, they have a Cal Fire that's organized under an umbrella of state, county, city. They work together when there's a big fire. But what happened on the Big Island? They just had a big lawsuit filed over there for what happened last year. The last time we had a fire, if it had gotten into, into our neighborhood there on Pilyuka, they'd never put those fires out. So every time we smell smoke, we go crazy. New Year's Eve, I'll be sitting in my farm waiting for my neighbors to set the valley on fire with their earlier fireworks. So we shouldn't have to live like that. And we can't keep losing money or we won't be any more farming. One more thing on farming. We need to reinstitute the, the weekly agriculture report of crop, how much the crops are selling for. The middlemen are really taking the farmers to, to the cleaners. And we need to know what, what is the price of something. So if you could do that, we appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. I'm so glad you brought this up, and it's because of you and Nancy and Hula Iaia and many others that really brought this to the forefront that I'm very happy to announce several things. Um, first, Ka'ala Farm is going to send another GIA for 500000 to continue the work they've already started in Wyandotte Valley for fire prevention, which includes things like wells and um, fire breaks and a possible gate even. We are also contacted by DLNR and they um, are going to work on a CIP with all of us to create four dipping tanks on the Waianae coast for the helicopters for 1.5 million. Um, they also want to um, put a bill in for 1.5 million per year in funding for fire prevention statewide. And then the city, HFD, um, within about 15 months, is going to, is going to uh, have a twin engine helicopter that is going to be about three times its current capacity. They said the fire pump that you mentioned. Is this thing, it is too, too, going to be too difficult because of the small areas they have to go into now. They said the twin inch is going to be about 600 gallons or so, it will be three times the capacity. So um, I'm really glad that you brought this to our attention, and so it is going to be a focus. Um, and we'll also look into this agriculture that you mentioned. So now we can go online. Yes. Yeah, I saw that Samson had his hand up. So I don't know how to be on you. Samson? Yeah. Okay, go ahead, Samson. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, hello. Hello, everybody. Hello. Yeah, we have people all in the online EPM on 4. 
you know, um, we were just all there. We was watching everything on phone, you know, and we get evidence on everybody and all stuff. And the way everything going, they forget about, they forgot about us coming up. Always go first, instead of everybody else. Because this stuff is more deep than, than just a homeless issue. If we all had land, we wouldn't feel homeless. You know, if we all had a peace for go through, we wouldn't feel homeless. Because we are gonna come only come to with you of this place. And you know, we cannot be having hard people just because they pay taxes, they think they get more food and us guys that just of the blood of the animals. You know, we gotta go back to remembering who all people came from. Well all people just came from in the beginning. Before money stopped and money came. But money is the root of all evil and everybody died for the money. And that's evil. We gotta get back to the our cause from the way we do have to worship the money. We we can build everything that we need right there. We don't waste nothing. The the system that we're running today, yeah, it's setting us up for corruption because we're worshiping the money and we only get Obama company in front of money. <laughs> nothing, nothing, nothing going true, but I gotta go because it's my two minutes. I love you guys. It's so funny for you guys. I love you guys. I love you guys. I, I still get talk for Love you too. Yeah, Article 12, Section 7. He was native to all their rights. They got to beat up on all rights because plenty of you guys officers don't know their rights. And for them guys, block access over here, who is this? And I'll stay no more, no more, no more access. I cannot even do my dad's celebration of life. And these guys came around a movie over here. That's him up. And I love you guys. I love our whole community. We love you Thank too, Samson. Time's up, babe. Thanks. Mahalo, Samson. Hello. Uh, Samson, thank you for joining us remotely. And if anybody ever forgot, as a native Hawaiian, you always have the right to collect and gather, no matter what. So that has always and was never changed. So to anybody who may not know that, thank you. Okay, Tiana. Yeah. So I can, I will publicly say that 
ourselves to follow up with those agencies and see on what sides. I don't want to say prevent, because there might be legalities in it, so don't hold me accountable to it. But how can we prevent certain things happening like that? Because I understand the frustration when we're stretched thin on resources and it's going to folks who have no opinion up to here. So I'm grateful for that, Kiana, for bringing that up. We'll follow up with our state side, which is Department of Human Services, and then Senator Chimokoporo will reach out to the city on our behalf. And when I say Senator, it's only as a, because she is our ranking member in the sense of seniority, but having her put out that kind of question is the protocol, the procedures for it. So if Miami puts out the call, we can get answers a lot more quicker because she's a Senator. So thank you, Tiara, for the question. Thank you, Michael. Well, um, anyways, um, the first time something that Zeb was asking about um, in uh, I don't know, I'm just comparing my ideas, guys. Um, I, I wanted to reach out to my reps and my senator about uh, potentially writing a uh, HRS uh, resolution for a study to basically increase the state's general firefighting capacity, whether it be just giving each county more money and equipment, like, like you said, the twin, the twin engine helicopter, or even potentially starting a DLNR uh, area of firefighting force using uh, water bombers as such. Um, if you could somehow, uh, I'd like help writing that because I've been kind of I've been missing my mind for a bit. Is um, I'd like to send from the legislature if possible this year or next session, I should say. Michael, thank you, Michael. Thank you for your comment. And there was one thing that also Miley and Cedric and I when we were in the meeting with HMD was also going on the state side to get the GIA or CIP money to allow rural fire-prone communities like West Oahu to have the money to do fire prevention and mitigation. So I think of Kahoela Warner and their folks at Nanakuli High School as they make the break several Nanakuli homestead, but that would allow for the expansion, the acknowledgement on the state side to do it for rural communities like ours that are fire prone. So that is something else that we'll be also be pushing as well. So thank you, Michael, for your comment. Good evening, ma'am, gentlemen. Um, my name is Jane Ascension. I was a, I had just come out of the military this year. I served in the Marine Corps from 2019 all the way up until um, March of this year. And for me, I grew up like, it was a, it was a part of poverty for me and a struggle for me and my family. I want to thank Auntie um, Chloe on the back. She came to my mind over at uh, Tomorrow's Brow. See, I work two jobs. Uh, I work two jobs to support my family and try to help my family. For me, my frustration is that we face eviction. And the recent year is a little bit of these property taxes going to skyrocket up to forty five hundred dollars from what I'm hearing. For that, that's a very frustrating part for me because I grew up in this town from I was born here, I was raised here. I mean, lately chasing this passion of mine to go ahead and uh, pursue music. For me, I'm a representation of my generation and the people that's going to leave this world since born. And I got people that listen to me, like, this is my music. And for me, my goal is to have these people relate through that. And Auntie Paloma is here to only try and find somebody that can translate lyrics to me more for the song that I write. A song speaking of struggle, poverty, drugs and all the all the issues going on, especially homelessness. 
because every corner of you in this town you've seen every corner around this town you've seen homelessness people, homeless people and it's breaking my heart. I've had friends and family fall for people for this. Before I leave, I just want to make this, make this clear. Whenever I go home tonight, remember these words and I stress it heavily. When it comes to adversity, most will, fall, most will run away from it. But all it takes is that one spark to start a fire. All it takes is that one percent. I just hope that this generation and everyone can stand together and fight all of these problems, all of these struggles that all of us are facing. Thank you. Thank you. Mahalo for uh, your comment, and I guess I'll speak to a little bit about um, just understanding the issue that we were talking about, and how can we as legislators provide help to the most vulnerable population. Uh, I had a, it, it was a hard experience uh, recently, my office wanted to help go out to our community, our houseless population, to provide services. And I want to give a special thanks to uh, my chief of staff, Crosscraft, for organizing a houseless service fair. Uh, he came from the city's housing office uh, when I reached out to him. He used to work in my office prior to that, but ended up getting a permanent position at the housing office with the city. But I reached out to him and said, you know, we really have to come up with something short term that we can do right now to go and address this houseless situation at Lani Line Park. I think at a point we had the most calls about that area specifically. Mainly from Surfside, mainly from people passing living in Mokaha, but we knew that it was an issue. And we didn't want to also just see this enforcement happened. And so we went out there uh, with KWO, Kialuabo, West Oahu, with the city. We worked with other nonprofit organizations like Project Vision and folks who provided uh, the portable uh, mobile hygiene center to go out there and we talk to them. And when I went out there, there was maybe like 10 encampments. Each encampment, I knew everyone in there. It was, it was wild. Because it was from different times in my life. When I was a little kid in elementary, when my, my classmates that I grew up with, and, you know, you just see the struggle in their faces and you know that, you know, they're battling something. That's something that needs to, uh, you know, be addressed. So the, the point of that conversation was, I know all of you guys, I know that there's a better path for you folks. And also there's all these services that are available and we want to try to, lead all of these people to the right areas, but at the same time, we also struggle with making them decide to do it. Because we can't necessarily force their hand, and I know there's been conversations about also trying to get the support that they need, but if people don't want to also take this support, then we're kind of stuck in a rock and a hard place, right? Then you get into the point of involuntary treatment and things like that, that I think we want to try to shy away from, and mainly try to get these folks to see that they can, we, we want them to do better than what they're at right now. But all in all, I know that we all are community members, we're all family, we're all one up. And when I see these individuals, that's how we want to treat them. Even though, you know, we get the thousands of complaints about them, we still see them as a human being and we still have that compassion for them. But for our next generation, I appreciate you coming here and uh, speaking your, your piece and your truth and I'm hopeful that people like you can engage with, with us to see how we all can play a role in solving these ongoing matters. So, Mahalo for being here. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Senator, we also want to thank you for your service to yeah. our. our You're how old are you? So I hope. Okay, 
I hope when you talk to us, you see yourself in myself and Cedric, as we are probably only seven of us under 30, the legislature out of 75. So we're working to include the voices of our generation, some of our legislator counterparts. You know, it's hard to, I think, maybe understand the things that we're facing when you have the generational gap. It's hard to talk about housing when you have a house. It's hard to talk about living when you don't have to worry about living. So your sentiments resonate with us, but I also just want to listen to hear you and not just discuss. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Also, an extra assumption that um, my chief of staff, Kiyahi, yeah, if you could stand, um, he speaks Hawaiian, and um, and so maybe you can connect with him, and he knows a lot of others that speak Hawaiian. <laughs> oh, and Cross, Cross Crab, also speaks Hawaiian. So you're looking for someone to help you translate your lyrics. Um, you got um, Kiyahi and Cross uh, to connect with you. Thank you. There you go. Oh. oh, is this someone online? I'm Malia Paso, and I suppose I'm here representing the neighborhood security watches. Uh, so our goes above and beyond to keep our parts from becoming infested with crime. It's beyond my <laughs> why city and county allows the parks to stay open past 8 o'clock, with the close time of 10, and all the crime and happens after dark. Many of these parks have no activity uh, qualifying them to be open till 10. They should be home doing schoolwork, doing their homework after 8 o'clock. And that's when all the crime sets in. And as far as um, the issue of um, I agree with uh, uh, Officer Payton on the, the opening up the sewers because sewers are already there and they butt right up the Ohio Street, which adjoins the Blue Lake Park, too, which is getting crime infested. And it's open till 10 o'clock at night. And the neighbors are, we come call and complain. The police do their change at 10 o'clock. So we don't get any results until maybe 11, and it's not documented unless we meet with an officer. So a lot of these complaints go on documented, and these issues that we deal with, they're 24 7, all night long, up and down the street. So if they're going to make sewers up, uh, they have to do something really. Close Blue Lily Beach Park 2 and down the Point High Beach Street. Oh, okay. So, um, and I uh, have a reservoir. Uh, neighborhood Security Watch put in a resolution to the neighborhood board. We put a petition in, and we have not gotten any results. Well, okay, thank you so much for your comments. Um, so yes, I, we'll, we'll look at your resolution and issues on the, on the legislature side in terms of looking at closing these parks that are so close to residences at an earlier time. And uh, for those who don't know, we're talking about that, that kind of middle part on Hokai Bay Street that's right near residences. So we're not talking about Hokai Bay, you know, the, the, the middle part. Um, and yes, and, and what you're saying is definitely, you know, a big concern. That's why this drop-off center that the judiciary is looking at is so important. We had that tragedy in Kanohe, where the mentally unstable homeless man killed a security guard recently. Uh, and that's the kind of thing that we want to put a stop to. You know, this is, this is unacceptable, and we need to, you know, get people that could be a danger to the public the help that they need, and not keep them wandering on the streets and beaches. You know, with that model. I don't think we have nobody else online. Now, so. Okay. Austin, thank you for being here. Hello. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the committee that you folks sit on, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, sitting, sitting on the Agriculture Committee as a chair or in a position? 
Yeah, so my committee is, is Agriculture and Food System Chairmanship, and then I have to sit on the Consumer Prevention Committee, that's CPC, and my last committee is Energy uh, Energy Environment Protection. Well, I got but Mike, what, what the chair or the uh, committee you sit on as far as chair or subcommittee for that? I'm going to be the chair of Hawaiian Affairs. I'm also a member of Health and Human Services. And I'm also a member of the Ways and Means Committee. So that's why I also want to hear your feedback. You know, the governor recently announced that Pekka Anderson as the proposed DHHL chair. Mm. Uh, so I want to hear your feedback from the community um, about that as well. I want it. Well, you know, what, I'm at, what I'm looking for is. Uh, So my vice chairmanship of the House Committee of Transportation, member of the House Committee, and member of Finance, which is Mayor's Ways and Means, the Senate. Okay. okay. Question is, what is the next legislation that's upcoming right now? Uh, Red Red Scott said some type of uh, hospital Senate bill in regulating outside countries purchasing our large land, our agricultural land especially. Uh, foreign countries coming in by our huge chunk of change, like about uh, 644. We need some type of legislation, a bill, a resolution, control the step of uh, entities coming in. If we can move to Korea or Japan and purchase, unless we're a citizen, and they can come here and disrupt our our way of living, we and our cultural land and all that, find it, cutting it up, and it's turning to something else. For example, agriculture. Agriculture, in the same sense, we need something for regular uh, legislation to help the farmers right now. They are hurting, my friends are hurting now the farmer for a fee. The prices went up on how much percent. This is twenty-one dollars a bag, now it's ten thirty-three, thirty-five dollars a grain bag. So we need some type of subsidy to assist the farmers out there, like agriculture farmers. And our homeless problem that's over here, because why not we're a law? So we welcome every entity, but we're not reserving. We need some type of legislation, regulatory, to share the Aramoa to all the other districts on this island and in your islands. To be their own kunyan, to take our kunyan. Because west side, we are agricultural land. We used to have dairies. We, my family go back to the fifth, we had poultry and Hawaiian homelands. Now we're grabbing everybody off the plane and everything. We need some type of legislation, regulatory, to pull back, pull back on this. And distribute it, share that all the rest of the rest of the state and the neighbor islands. Pick your your own kunia. This is our kunia. Pick your your own. Thanks for that question and um, your comments regarding ag as well, uh, tied into this issue of uh, homelessness. But uh, for ag stuff, I'll just put in that real quick. Uh, please uh, reach out to us. We'd love to hear your proposals. Put in our paper. We're writing notes today, uh, but we'll follow up on that to make sure that we have accurate information on how we can support our local farmers out here. Yeah, so food district, uh, food uh, brokers right now have moved to mid state, and the cost of bringing it in is crunching all the farmers over here. Poultry, pigger, uh, you name even though, no, I don't need my dog. <laughs> but anyway, but the farm is just done. But it's, it's costing too much on the feed, the grain. It's an impact. We need some type of, uh, some kind of uh, scripts to assist the farmers over here. Right. Okay, the legitimate farmers. Okay? Some so, kind of scripts. So definitely subsidies, subsidies is uh, yes, that word. something we can talk about. Regarding that. And then for the house side of it, uh, we talked about putting this services in different communities and if you did, didn't catch uh, Governor Green's inauguration speech, this is something that he proposed as well. It's putting one in every council district pretty much and I think that we can do that with providing the funding from the state side. And my first bill, my the, the bill that I always talk about, which is Alhanda's bill, the first draft of that bill basically required it to be in every council district. 
because I think that was way more fair than, you know, trying to just place all the burden in one community, as you mentioned. And we know that we also have our own struggles too, that we need to be able to meet those needs too for our district. So not saying um, against all projects like in our district, because I think there still needs to be some to serve our people here. But again, I hear you a lot of clear on how that, not, not that, I want to say burden, but that responsibility that Kuliana is on all of us as members of our Honolulu County. And so I look forward to having the funding be placed as Governor Green proposed in his executive budget just this, was it yesterday or today? It just, he just dropped his executive proposal and it includes millions, 15 million for this Ohana Zone bill as well as other public services. So whose committee will be in some type of health committee? Or so it's going to be health, uh, on the health side we have health, human services and homelessness. And it also will probably go in a little bit on uh, Darius's committee, which is how Okay, so if you can get with him after, and then you guys can iron it up because the time was up 10 minutes ago. <laughs> Thank you, Austin. <laughs> okay, so I just wanted to let you know that in 20, well, actually in 15 minutes, we're going to stop this discussion and we're going to move on to transportation, so hurry up. <laughs> Before I turn to go, can you folks give Andy Burgett a big round of applause for the very Thank you, Andy Burgett. Aloha. Hi. Aloha, everyone. Thank you. On uh, second, my, my light bulb went off when you mentioned that you're part of the agriculture. All right. So I sit on the board of Ho'omaukeo. Ho'omaukeo La is um, a treatment center. And it's also a culturally uh, healing center as well. So, all of Waianae Ahukua used to be Kalo and Taro. I want to advocate for that. If you can help bring the water back, and so our community can get all together and start planting when the Kalo actually thrives. And we can get our uh, fish back uh, that returning, you know, to our shoreline and all that. I've been advocating for this for like six, seven years now. So this is not only a program for healing, but it's to heal our community as well. You, you know, so I, I'd like to work with you at some point and um, uh, sit down with our board and see what we can do. The struggle right now is the body, and we need that because it's being directed all over the place, except for that place where the, our wife and I all, uh, our wife and I was very rich in the, the color and um, in Hua, and then so many other, you know, animals and things like that. But, but real quick, it's just that, that is what I think as far as our Hua community can get involved. It can heal everybody besides our, uh, besides those that have, uh, you know, uh, addiction problems and so on and so forth. Yeah. So I'm keeping it short, but that's what I would like to um, sit down okay. with all of you. Hey, okay. Thank you. Thank you for serving in the various roles that you do. Uh, you bring so much aloha to our community, and uh, you make us all proud to be from one. Uh, so on the ag side, I feel like there should be a combination of ag and housing. I think that's something that we need to promote more of. Even with our houseless community, I think that's a model that can be sustainable because say, for example, you create a workforce of farmers to our houseless population who more than likely are very hands-on. I mean, some of these guys are very creative and we all see their different uh, ideas on display across our community. But I really think that if we turn that into a more focused direction, into getting people into housing as well as being able to provide food, and I can just see them selling it at YMA Farmers Market. Uh, you know, one day once these productions start going and we are giving them uh, the access that they need to land and water and 
all the other resources that are important to creating a sustainable ag production line. Uh, that's something that I feel is strongly uh, needed and working with the water and land chair, I think we're going to have a lot of conversations on water rights. And I feel that that's going to be something that I'm looking towards the community as and our kupuna who have been in the long fight to restore our water rights uh, across the coastline to get input on how we can do it successfully and make sure that uh, everyone is being treated fairly, especially for our, our local farms that have been here for generations. So that's something that I'll work on as your Ag Chair and Food Systems Chair, and I look forward to hearing more conversations with other people. Oh. Yeah. So in light of what we just talked about, I want to acknowledge the huge thing that just happened this morning for Waianae Coast Comprehensive Health Center. They got the approval from DHHL to do their food campus expansion that will start here when Center Talk. Yes, please give a round of applause. And I want to acknowledge Alicia Zika and Nikki who run Hello Mayo Social Services that will be the head of that. I know we have our CEO Rich somewhere, but also that is is the brainchild of what we're talking about when Cedric says housing and food systems. The food that will be grown on the campus throughout Wine and Comprehensive will be edible. The housing that will be available here at Wine and Coast Comprehensive on DHHL land will be for our kupuna. So the most vulnerable, the food answers, and everything. So I look forward to seeing them be the spotlight. We just had something momentous happen this last Friday. For the first time in Wine and Club's history, we brought the Office of Hawaiian Affairs here to Hawaiian Coast Conference Health Center. They have never been here in the existence of Hawaiian Coast. It's shocking to say the least, but now that they know we are here and what we need, I look forward to partnering with, partnering with all of them and all of us to make sure that they can fulfill the judiciary duties of supporting our Hawaiian communities. So thank you. I am a Hawaiian Homestead Beneficiary SC, um, and I do congratulate the comp. Also, Ka'ala Farms was uh, permitted to continue what they are doing for their expansion. And uh, I just want to let everybody know that Wine and Valley Homestead Community Association was also at the DHHL meeting today. And uh, we have also been giving a right of entry to this land right below us in between the comp and the uh, wastewater treatment plant. We will be building a community-based renewable energy solar farm. This is the for one and one and one. We look to that success so that we can build it larger for more beneficiaries. And I'm specific about the beneficiaries because that is what the Hawaiian homelands has been set aside for. And oftentimes, we also share it as well as our own dollars with the broader community. Because what is said and known is what is good for the Hawaiian is good for Hawaii. So it's really to me hard when we always get pushback sometimes from our own people. But pushback is okay because that's how we grow together. We understand where each other is coming from. We don't want bobblehead action. We never want bobblehead action. Um, the other thing that I want to hold, so regarding the CDRE, part of that request that the association made was for a crematorium in that same site. So we are going to uh, have community meetings because we want to welcome community Manao on that crematorium as well as our CBRE so that when we go back to the Department of Hawaiian Homelands and their commissioners so that we can show them that this is a niche and a need for most of us because as you look at our coastline, where are we going and how are we getting there? by cremation. So why should we go to town or somewhere else to support a business when we can have our own kanaka in our own community? Kanaka in the community is what we need to support. That is buying local from your own people. Although this machine is coming from Molokai, their member, her daughter, is Wainai Valley Homestead resident and beneficiary. The other two things I wanted to ask was we did have a ad champion, 
uh, Rep. Jones about 20 years ago. That's when we had our dairy farms, we had our pig farms, we had our bag farms. So we need that egg champion again. And the third and last request I ask of you is to get us our sibling that comes from Waikele all the way to Honokai Hale. Because when you go to town, you are facing that traffic. We can't even get to that zip line because we're back at Kuala Kai. We need our own zip line. So we need action this year, which is like 10, 15 years kind of late, because it's going to take a lot that long for it to happen. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, actually, that we are going to go into transportation next, so she only has one minute in the next time that she has a question for the next round. But we're going to stop at, at you. You're going to be the last person that we're going to allow because we need to move on. Otherwise, you're going to be here till tomorrow morning. I think of all, how can people get a hold of you if they have questions? They come back to the mic. Sorry. Okay, so we're going to use our uh, community based renewable energy. So it is W B H C B R E. White Alai Valley Homestead Community Based Renewable Energy. Or ask my she can get a hold of me. She'll get me my, my email, but I prefer that we use that instead of my personal email. And I think you prefer that too. Well, I'll right here. Good work. Aloha, I'm Lily Kavinatan. I'm a long time resident as I grew up here. I'm a farmer. Um, I, I have a farm right here in Maui. I'm a lemon farmer and I want to tell all of you um, yes, farming is great. We need farmers, but we also need to grow our own. It's very expensive. I grow lemons and I sell them to Down to Earth and Foodland for $2.50 and they sell them for $5 and that's what you guys pay. Grow your own, it's very simple. Grow your own vegetables and whatever. That's sustainable. But why I'm here today is because I want to shout out to Nankuni High School. They won $25,000 first place for sustainable um, agriculture. What they're doing is they're spreading, yes. They're spreading cardboard to put underneath our, my mango trees and for the farms or for your homes and it, and it works and it's awesome. So they created this whole plan and they do it monthly. You go take your cardboard there and they'll shred it and you can take it back. And what I do, the farmers, we donate lemons or other fruits to them and what they do is they make CSA uh, boxes and they give it to the community as they bring the boxes in, uh, the cardboards in. So they created that whole plan. Tomorrow they will be on Hawaii News Now from 5 o'clock in the morning to 8 o'clock because of all of this. So watch the news tomorrow. Thank you. And I'm so glad that you're agriculture because we're going to make things happen. Thank you. Shout out to Nancy Lily, she is my uh, vice principal at Hawaii. <laughs> All right, this will be really quick. I'm Shelby Billionaire. I'm with the Hawaii Kingdom Post Office. We're also the number one investigative force for human trafficking and drug smuggling. It's called Hawaii Kingdom Task Force by the U.S. Department of Interior. So I have a report for you. I'm going to finish this really fast. So we have two major issues. Human trafficking, which means extortion, and smuggling. Smuggling is when you cross different borders. Maui County, California. So we're going to go straight to the solutions for you guys. We need four things. Number one, an aftercare program for boys and girls. We have Polo and Apu, but only does girls underage. We need a place for boys. You can't have them together because they're going to utu to bang bang. We got drugs. We got you. We got time for that. We got you. Okay, that's number one. Number two, we really need resources for rescue operations. Because we're dealing with the mafia. Big names, even Steve Baum can't prosecute these bad guys like Sunday they hold the world. We can't even get in touch with Arrow Sellers sisters in that case. So it's still under investigation, so I can't say too much on that one. But when, with Arrow Sellers bill is the next string. Governor Ige vetoed it and he told our team because it was unconstitutional for foster parents. So if you guys can push the bill and it'll modify it, that'll work. And number four, we need to hold some of these people accountable for the state. So we're on the big island, and I'm going to represent here is that they're selling our children to have sex with minors. 7,000 to 10,000 is the price range. They're sacrificing children for satanic calendars. They're using a cover for 501c3s, nonprofits, hope services, and they're being sued right now. 
They were run by the Roman Vatican Church. You guys didn't know. And so, some things that you should write down that you shouldn't have your kids hang around with. One of them is Michelle Kobayashi. She's the Ghislaine Maxwell of Hawaii. You have Paul Sula running ayahuasca and drugs, who's also part of his pedophile network, and Timothy Williams. It's been seconds. So we do need your help with that, because if you try to report this to CWS or the Intel, the kids disappear. The last case we were doing was in the Valley Canyons, and you don't know where the kids are, like Lokelani and some of these nieces. After they get to CBS, they, they disappear, and we don't know where they're accountable. So we just have to all that. So we wrote down some of that stuff, but it, I, I just want to give the purview for some of the sensitive information that was shared by Shelby and not necessarily on our state side. Um, it is if we're guilty for the legality. But thank you for bringing that forward. Thank you for coming to every single community event. And thank you for sharing what we do in this community. I appreciate you seeing up the events. We were just at the Mormon Church in Honolulu a couple of weeks ago where these folks who bust human traffickers across the world do a lot of missions in some of these poor countries. And they just gave the Honolulu Police Department a dog that can send out microchips that tells these sensitive materials that child pedophilia exists on. Crazy stuff, but the work is being done. And some of the stuff that shall be mentioned, we will follow up on. So thank you. You know, 
know, like when Chaplin, you know, right in the line by us, and people hear this in the code. So that was one thing I um, wanted to mention. Um, the other one was, uh, I like the fire break scenes, you know, but at what point are we gonna uh, address, you know, the full situation? If you look at the fire break, that's like, you know, your 50 meter target. What is my 200 meter target? So like that, um, you know, this is like a twofold thing. Um, working on restoring our forests, yeah, planting our trees and whatnot, all our native plants. Uh, but the other thing is, you know, my wife, she uh, petitioned, she's the one who started the petition with the Board of Water Supply, she brought it to the table, you know, and somehow it went to where the Board of Water Supply wanted to regulate wells. That's not what was asked for. What was asked for was to help to return some of the water to our streams, for the fish ponds, to uh, reforest our valleys with native plants. Because at one time, a um, long time ago, you know, in the time, they could paddle one canoe from Popeye uh, all the way up to Pau, that's a fact. So that just gives you an idea how big, uh, you know, our stream used to be. And uh, the other one I wanted to mention was, oh, I'll say that for a transportation. So at this time, I'd like you all to applaud all of our people who came up with their manao and their questions. But I'd also like to ask, if you're sitting next to somebody, you don't need to kiss them or anything like that, but I'd like you to just reach on their shoulders and just massage them a little bit. A little bit. A little bit. Okay, stop touching. Um, Wanted to respond. Sorry, I never get the last time. Go ahead. No problem. Uh, I'll be quick with it. Uh, mahalo Joseph for coming up and uh, providing that for now. I really like the idea of the city buses to try to get services out globally. As we know, a lot of the uh, state services are in Kabule or in town. So having something mobile to come out to Waina is something we can definitely look into. Uh, and then for the ag side, I, I definitely think there needs to be that conversation and mahalo to uh, your wife for introducing the board of water supply and thing. And I know that it uh, might have went a little bit further than I think you guys expected it to, but I think it also gives us the opportunity to have that conversation on water rights in our community. And I think we can utilize that to kind of spin the narrative for what we want, right? And, and use that to our benefit. Um, and I think when these conversations continue, uh, we can flesh out these ideas like you mentioned. And with the agriculture side, again, I'm, I'm very excited to uh, reflect the state's priority in the budget because right now only 0.4% of our $8 billion budget goes to agriculture. But we yet we talk about increasing all this agriculture and restoring all of our bread baskets and everything we but it doesn't reflect in our budget. And so for me, one of the things that I'm looking at doing right now is uh, I'm gonna be pushing for a position inside of the Department of Agriculture for grants. Um, there's a lot of federal dollars that we leave on the table that could be going into our communities and supporting our local farmers and all these different agriculture proposals. So that's one thing. And then also on the tax bar uh, for the tax on oil barrels, uh, I believe 45% of the dollar 40 that comes to the state was supposed to go to agriculture. And meeting with the previous ag director, uh, I was informed that only 15% of that 45 cents is actually reaching the uh, account for the Department of Agriculture. So we want to see that 30 cents put back into there so that we could raise uh, approximately $30 million to go to the Department of Ag. So that's something that we want to uh, also make a priority moving into 2023. So I hope that touched a little bit on what you brought up. And uh, I look forward to also working with you guys on the community aspect to um, do a lot of this work as well. So mahalo. Mahalo. That's awesome. So um, as we heard from our legislators, what they're doing here is they're reaching out and they're just saying we need to have we need to have a relationship. So if they're busy, which they are going to be starting legislative session mid-January to mid-May or early May, 
Um, reach out to their, their aides. They're here tonight. Get their information, get their contact information. Make sure that the discussions that you started here continues. That you, you so that they can report back to you what's going on, where are we in the process, and sometimes certain things are just not going to make it in this in the legislative session. Other times it will, but just know that if they're going to be proposing these um, these action items, you're going to have to be right behind them to support them and make sure that um, that it gets through because it does take. A, a community to do the work that we all need to do together. So it's all about Pina. Remember that word for 2023 because this is where we're going to be. Our Y and I move who is going to be strong because we're going to work together as one. So at this time, I'd like for uh, our legislators to report on transportation and then we're going to do the same thing. We're going to do alternating back and forth for online and and in person, the amount of any questions, and then we need to be out of here by um, 8.25, so as you can see, I will take you out if you take longer than two minutes. <laughs> well, I'll all start. Um, so on the second page of my handout, um, you'll see uh, transportation, which is a big issue for us. So the first is the Pa'akea Road. And so the big thing we're gonna try and do is create a parallel route working on for some time now is already formally allocated. And we want to try to remove the gates um, at Pahakea. So it's actually an open um, area that we can get from the naval road um, to Hakimo and then to Pahakea and all the back roads there. But there's bad traffic. The second is the contractual and turn lanes. Um, we want to extend that fifth lane so we can have a there's a turn lane eastbound at um Nandikeola and the Lewis Street and Ulule Naval Road. And that will also extend the concha flow in the afternoon coming home. Pakaha um, Surfing Beach, uh, we want to implement the master plan. And DOT does intend to again reapply for the raise grant um, to, to accomplish that. And that will be you know, some, something similar to what you see at Sandy's the Beach, right? You're going to see the highway that's up Malka, on the Malka side of the beach. And the current road will become a beach road for parking and that kind of thing. And then finally, um, Princess Kahanu and other places um, have asked for some more speed humps to address speeding there. Um, DOT has been very cooperative in helping um, DHHL. They already did some speed humps in Honolulu Valley, and now they're willing to also help the Princess Kahanu area. Um, and also looking at areas, other areas, stretches like right here by Stacks to St. John's Road, where there's a lot of rear ends and stuff like that. So looking at putting speed humps in other high speed areas. So that's the big four that are in my hand now. I don't either Darius or Susan want to add more. What a privilege that I get to sit as Vice Chair of Transportation for our community to address some of the issues that are happening. So when I think of legislative ideas, priorities, and issues, how we tackle them, I'm thinking long term and I'm thinking short term. I'm also acknowledging that what they're reporting is that 30 to 40 years, we're going to lose our coastline here on West of, on the White Coast. So that is also a reality that we have to face. It's a double-edged sword that we live on the ocean here in Hawaii and I, where we get the beautiful coast right next to our houses, but we also face the imminent threat of climate change. So starting with that fifth lane is a huge thing because we know it's those small pockets that can disrupt everything here on the White Coast. So the big master plan is to ask Governor Green, because it was allocated in the last fiscal budget, $30 million to do the expansion from the Wendy Shopping Center all the way down to Hakimo Road. That would be the start of the fifth lane. And then afterwards, we do another request to go from Mahili down into Waianae, all the way to Makaha to get extra lanes for all of them. I know some folks will say adding lanes will add more cars, but what is different about our community is that there really is no other developments coming up. So we're kind of at that max capacity for where we're at. Not much more housing will come on our side that would be like Koa Ridge or Ho'opili that would add that much cars. So knowing that we can alleviate that way, it would be a huge help. 
But when we also talk about transportation, a big one that we have to acknowledge is what our landfills play into traffic and transportation in the West Oahu area. Me and Senator Shimabukuro reminded the city that under the circumstances for the extension of the landfill, we ultimately oppose Waimanalo Gulch being extended in the past 2030. When you talk about the amount of semis that come into our community on any given day, it is 500 trucks. 500 trucks at 40 to 50 feet in length with 18 tires does not just occupy space, it puts wear and tear on our roads, but adds that extra traffic that we are facing. So the removal of 500 trucks, I think, would also be a huge make a dent in the traffic that we're facing here on the coast. I know a huge thing that gets brought up all the time is a secondary access route into Wayanai. And I want to be very sober when we talk about that. Because for any Hawaiian who knows, when you go inland, you're going to find Ibi Kupuna. Some of these places have not been touched for many, many years. And I hate to be the legislator to disrupt some of that. But I don't want to use that as an excuse to not acknowledge the issues that we're facing. But I want it to be clear too, that when we talk about government and projects, you barter and you wage. And when you ask for a secondary road into our community, I'm scared of what would come at that cost. Because who is that road for? Is it for us? Or is it folks from the North Shore to be able to come here? Is it folks from town to come here? I, I, I want us to get sober in that idea. And when you talk about development and the, the zone changes that would have to happen, they would not give us that road for free. Housing would come, businesses would come, because development signals all of that. I'm not anti-development, but I'm also anti-gentrification. So we have to find a good way to keep some of the stuff that we have here in our community the best. Because we're not the only community in the state that is facing this issue. I think about Ta'ala out in North Shore. I think about Waimea. I think about the one way in and one way out on Hawaii Island. But like I said, right, it's Pandora's box if you open some of those roads and you change development. Because who do the road service and who do they benefit? So I see a lot of nodding heads and I hope you folks understand and I, I'm grateful that you guys can kind of understand where I'm coming from on some of those things. Now speed bumps in are super controversial. I know folks will say the speed bumps at Nalapuli is what caused traffic. I will wholeheartedly say for the DOT that going 35 miles an hour with a speed bump is what it is designed for. It's when you're going two miles over and you're coming to a complete stop, that's where the thing is. I sometimes launch it at 40, and I have to be I'm not happy to launch it at 40, but it really is, so we're not coming into Nalapuli at 60 miles an hour. You know, I I hear, Joe, what you're saying for Lehoku, so I hope now as Vice Chair, working with Cedric, that we can get those monies for you folks in Lehoku. I hope the GET bill that we can author will help the private roads like Mrs. Kapina Tan get those access to the needed infrastructure that we need in this community. I will say this, we are having, I, I don't want to say we, but I think they support me. Is St. John's to Mahili Mahili Road is a drag strip. So we are looking at putting speed bumps in this area because far too many people have died, far too many accidents have happened. The thing is, when you continue to have more accidents in your community, there is the unintended consequences that folks might not see. Do you know your homeowner's insurance goes up more when you live next to a highway that is deemed dangerous? So some of those things, if we can do some of the tangible work in front, we won't have to feel it in the back. Also working with the Nanakuli Homestead to continue the project to have speed bumps all the way down Nanakuli Avenue and the Highway. Third and fourth row just came to me asking for speed bumps. The thing is that what we need, right, is when you folks come and ask to us, we need the buy-in. Because we can't be putting in these projects and then somehow we're going to get hit on the back end. 
Because we want to support two folks, but it has to be a, a, a couple of names. I don't doubt they hope who is on board for that. So I'm excited to see how we can get the buddies over there. Ed Stephen, an amazing Kanaka, is at the helm of DOT now. He used to run highways and now he's in charge. I'm super excited to work with Ed. He had a good rapport with Representative Eli, and I'm able to continue that same rapport. They've stepped up on the state side to help with trash pickup for the unhoused communities in Nanakuli. So DOT is very much committed to seeing the projects here come into fruition. I know a lot of things we ask for is a, a flashing crosswalks. I will say that sometimes those are at cost. I don't think folks remember at Long's at one point we used to have the flashing crosswalk in the ground because it got too expensive to be replacing because people would steal it. That got axed. But the solar power lights that would allow the crosswalks would be good. But also something too that I want the state to explore is traffic calming and the expansion of how you view roads. We notice here in Hawaii we don't have a break in our roads, but when you travel to the continent they have all these breaks in between, whether it's a 15-foot barrier, plants, trees, those all affect the science behind you driving. It makes you a little bit more aware, it makes you want to take care of where you're at, but when you just have open asphalt, it sometimes triggers these responses that we might not be aware of. So looking at legit traffic coming, but also expanding our road, I know that sounds like an oxymoron in itself, but I'm hoping what we can do in the communities for West Oahu with transportation, especially among safety, will go throughout many of the communities throughout Hawaii. And I hope when these projects come into fruition that you folks can wholeheartedly support us because it is the it is because of the request that you folks ask these projects that we can put forth these projects. I like what Anthony said about the expansion of the zipper lane. That is a long term, but short term is traffic safety. So I know that some of it I don't want to continue talking. I want to hear where your folks' ideas are at when it comes to transportation. I'm really excited about the Pa'akea Access Road because if the state can work with the city to condemn the road, the state becomes the owner. It brings it up to county standards. We have two lanes, we have sidewalks, but it literally allows the parallel access from Mahinigine all the way into Helipo uh, in the case that we have to move from Old Frank and other way. I know it's not the best, but it's something, and I hope to continue the conversations. But at this point, in Georgia, if you can, uh, or Senator, sorry. Uh, for me, uh, as all of you know, for us living in District 45, which is from the Ilili Road to Kiabula, we bear the brunt of traffic. Um, when I was walking door to door, 90% of individuals that I talk to, their number one priority is addressing traffic. And that started conversations up again about that secondary access role, which I fought very hard for, but I do understand concerns from our Nanakuli neighbors uh, who live uh, near the area that the role was being proposed. I feel though that uh, as Darius brought up, climate change, sea level rise are all real threats to our community. And as we look at being prepared for natural disasters, we also have to think about transportation, whether it's for emergency services, getting out resources like food and so forth, and also just protecting our coastline in general. Uh, we have to think of that as long-term goals for sure. But I think in the short term, uh, opening up the emergency access routes are a right step in the in the right direction because I think that also we can build onto this emergency access road uh, and, and build out the, potentially a secondary access road through this emergency access route that is already created, that is already uh, in partnership with the city, the federal government, private landowners, as well as uh, the state. So looking at ways that we can see that come to fruition through the importance of being prepared for natural disasters and sea level rise and uh, man-made disasters, we need to think about that. 
and continue to keep that at the forefront of discussions as we as we go through. But as we all know, majority of the traffic is in not a movie. And uh, <laughs> not to put the blame on uh, Senator or Darius, uh, but we really need CIP funding that continues to go to the expansion of Farrington Highway, whether it's the synchronization of traffic signals, connecting our fiber optic cable so that we have uh, connection to our traffic management center, uh, having all of these different pieces in place so that we have our best version of transportation for our community. So that's something that we always advocate for. And I'm so happy that Senator Shimogokuro and I, as well as uh, Rep. Eli, was able to secure all this funding over these past six years that are going to all these projects. And I want to ask the community to bear with us. We know government is slow. Um, whether it's procurement process, whether it's construction process, the design and planning, the EIS, all of these things that need to go into actually making a project come to life is something that we also have to keep at the forefront of our mind as well and how these projects actually get constructed. So that's just something to put out there. And a lot of times there's also uh, easement issues where you have to consult a private landowner or uh, eminent domain where you have to actually take people's land away where that's actually you know very controversial in itself but these are all the different issues that as the administration of our state executive branch of our state these are the stuff that they have to go through where for us we just secure the funding pass the laws that need to get passed so that these projects actually can come through the pipeline so that's something that we, we will continue to work on. Uh, the fifth lane, I feel like that will be a amazing blessing to our community, especially those that live in District 45, because what we can also do with that is create a contra flow all the way down to uh, Hakimo Road or some, somewhere close to that area, uh, with the fifth lane being, being extended from uh, Haleakala Avenue. So that's something that we can use for both AM and PM traffic. So I know there was a big issue with Contraflow in the past for our teachers and our healthcare workers. That could be alleviated and be more of an incentive for those professionals to come work in our community because they don't have that uh, brutal commute that a lot of us have to go through on an everyday basis. And with that, I would also like to mention that we do have to do a better job at uh, flood mitigation that we just experienced recently, uh, today, yesterday. Uh, flooding is an issue for Farrington Highway, and I think that we also have to put a lot more effort into getting uh, DOT on board and all of the different partners. Because just for example, Lulu Lay, uh, both the Lulu Lay, uh, Mokai side, where the flooding is always bottling up. That's both city and state, and so we kind of have to have that agreement for both parties to be able to actually move on a solution. And if that's not happening, we don't have buy-in from the city or we don't have buy-in from the state. It makes it a harder road to climb. And so that's something that we hope we can encourage the collaboration that is needed for that. And lastly, I'll end it off on bridges. Uh, Wakaha Bridges, the estimated completion for that is March 2023, according to DOT's website. And for my Palaboa Bridge, uh, June 2023. So March 2023 for my Bridges, June 2023 for my Palaboa Bridge. And, uh, I also want to thank our community for putting up with all the craziness that has occurred in the past with the bridges and I hope that we can build a better bridge uh, with our executive branch to make sure they're listening to the community. I think at the end of the day that's what we as legislators are also a vessel for the community's voice and so many of the concerns that we brought up are going directly to the people that are actually making the decision on the project. So even night work, that's something that we are always encouraging because we know that having it in the daytime is a burden on our community and we should try to 
we need to be mindful of everybody's job and everybody trying to work and everybody trying to get home to their family. So with that being said, again, looking forward to more solutions being brought from the community and mahalo for your time. Round of applause for our legislators, mahalo, mahalo. Okay, he's been waiting since the beginning. <laughs> Aloha. Aloha. Taurus, congratulations on your nomination. Congratulations on your culture. It's my special is transportation. Some of you that may not know me, my name is James Cowles. I'm retired truck driver of 42 years. No accidents and no tickets in 42 years. Also, I've also was also a member of the Wainai Neighborhood Board, and I was also a member of the Namakuri Mainai Neighborhood Board, and I was the transportation chairman of the Namakuri Mainai Neighborhood Board. Anyway, I want to say Merry Christmas to you folks. I have I had three questions, but you answered one of them. My first question is, while I was sitting on the Wainai Neighborhood Board, we brought up the access road on Pacquiao at that time. That was a long time ago. And when I sat on the Miley and Nanakuri Neighborhood Board, we were still fighting for that access. And my understanding was, when we were sitting, when I was sitting on the board, what we were told was, that road was supposed to have been open a long time ago. We had the money allocated for that, to open the gates, to do the improvements on the road. At that time, the road was up to stand up to code, so they had to get the road up to code. My understanding was the road was supposed to be up to code already, and it was supposed to be open already. My second question is, how can we get a left turn lane signal at Kapamana and Ferrington Harry. We already have the left turn lane, but we're not a lane. That's the only street on there that does not have a left turn lane. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Have everybody have a good one. Thank you, Mr. Powell. So from my understanding, the previous funding that he's talking about when it comes to public care fell apart in the city. Right? No, but the early, from the beginning inception, the city had allocated that money in advance. So this new, I, I hate to say new, because I know it's been talked about forever, but the new approach is for us to put forth the money because the private landowner also gave the city a bit of a hard time on the sale of the land. So the, the whole point is, the new, the new attack is for the state to purchase the land, condemn the property, bring it up to code, and then allow it to be a full-time access road. What Cedric was talking about before going into the non included communities, there was concerns because we do then would be pretty much moving what's similar to Farrington Highway into communities like Princess Mahal. And I hate to say this, some of our community members cannot drive to save their lives. You know, cannot use the blinker, cannot follow a speed limit, and I would not want some of you folks to my that. So I understand the concern, especially when it comes to safety. But I really have investiture and in, in, in strong belief with Ed when he told us that what we can do with allocating this money, condemning it. So, once we can get that point within this legislative session, Mr. Powell, I will make sure that you're a to it. And then with the last turn signal, I wrote that down, and I can email a DOT tomorrow to see what the request and how that process would be. So, know that I will. Do we have any online? No. Um, okay. Club, but I cannot. So, 
a couple years ago, I was um, just was doing a project. Okay, so I I was on Lahaina Street, where Makama Intermediate School is a little bit. Is. Okay, so I was observing that the track over there is terrible. Also, is that street um, city or state? Because, yeah. City, but I can answer a little bit about that. Okay, okay. Uh, because the dangerous part of it is the kids have to walk on the road to get to school because um, because um, people park their cars on the outside, so the kids and the mamas pushing the babies that walk on the road. So I would like to see a um, what do you call that sidewalk. It, I, I, so I'm not sure what jurisdiction that yeah. falls under. So for the sidewalk in that area, it could fall under the city. Um, I, I have worked with some folks out there, uh, Aliyah, Tid, and uh, some other community, concerned community members in the area to do speed humps. But uh, I know that there have been hurdles with the city in terms of the uh, Department of Transportation Services getting the approval or basically moving on it. But what they have been advocating to us about is they want to make sure that the community is on board. But of course, we will, we want them to do their job with the speed study and do all the different things that would determine whether the area needed uh, these improvements. Uh, and then I believe what you're talking about too with all it's it's, uh, it's not a sidewalk, it's like a walk path. And I can't remember the terminology exactly used for that rain uh, uh, asphalt that lines Lahaina Street. It's so they that's area not like yes. So Lahaina does have that raised walking path, but it's not a actual sidewalk, if that makes any sense. Yeah. It's just raised asphalt. But in that same area, one of the things that we were able to uh, advocate for and was able to install was that speedometer. Basically yes. it's a speed sign that shows how, how fast somebody's going to try to encourage people to slow down. On top of that, in terms of the traffic in that area, uh, we were able to secure funding for Mapa Elementary to do ground improvements. Mm -hmm. And what they're looking at is reconfiguring their parking lot to allow for a better flow of traffic uh, in that area. And so I know we're working, we're, we've been on DOE because how it works is that when we allocate the money for the schools, it goes to the Department of Facility Maintenance on the DOE side, Department of Education side. And then what happens is that they work with the principals to actually implement the project and actually construct it. So I think right now they're in the process and we've been constantly reaching out to them for updates on where the where we're at on in the process. And I think the latest thing we're waiting for is the groundbreaking ceremony. Uh, so there's going to be a groundbreaking ceremony next year to start the project that we're talking about to improve the traffic flow in the area as well as uh, 21st century learning center. But uh, that's something to look forward to as well. Um, Mahalo, it's just this is a concern that um, as a project or um, anyone that lives in the Makaha um, district, uh, the Hawaiian Civic Clubs are very involved in the community from Nanai Kupono, Hawaiian Civic Club, Uwebole Hawaiian Civic Club, Waikanai Hawaiian Civic Club, and Maka Hawaiian Civic Clubs. So if there's any projects or any uh, things that, you know, the community has something to say about your local, uh, your Ahuwa, please, uh, come see me. Mm -hmm. Second thing, we know Kapolei is building up, uh, you know, 
maybe somehow look at a joint traffic management center in Tampa Bay because the team booting up, whether we like it or not, you know what I mean? And our traffic is always jammed up on our side. Um, let's see. Oh, so mahalo for the uh, construction guys at my power wall. I don't think uh, the community really knows how bad that bridge was. So these guys, they, they're doing a really good job. Nobody understands unless they went on the internet and looked at it before, which I did, which is funny. But um, if we can ask DOT to be more proactive rather than reactive this year, you know, send out the engineers more often, more frequently to check the bridges out. Um, other thing is uh, OMPO, the 2030 plan. Um, if you guys can start looking at uh, the six lanes from Kimo Road to Kapo I know maybe no startup with five lanes, you know, just, I don't know, but there's one out there. Uh, going to be open very, um, last thing I'm going to say. Uh, as much as possible, pull the cities here, tell them that we need something by our, all of our elementary schools. Because, you know, too much time a lot of the kids get banged right in front of the school. And it's, it's sad, you know, they just trying to get an education, and they're not worried about getting back, you know, they get it by cars, but, uh -huh. yeah. so, so, I, I, I forgot, I forgot to mention this, I am also the designated house member to sit on OMPO as well, the OMPO Metropolitan Planning Organization, so we just had our first meeting today, and it just was pretty much the formalities of it. But I can definitely bring that up in our January so you can see where the money is at. Um, Joe also hosts NSW meetings at their Valley with uh, John M. So the Kokai Bay group meets at their Valley and discuss NSW issues. So if you ever want to connect with them as well, there are resources available to us. They, for probably as long as I know, they've advocated for the speed mitigation in their areas. They're right across the elementary school. So I, I, I feel you folks. If you folks don't know, I live right on Carrington Highway in Malibu, right behind the old money mark. So I am very familiar with Carrington Highway. It is my alarm clock. It's at 5 o'clock. I hear the cars. I know it's time to get us. Um, my below bridge, for folks who don't know, it was one of ten of the worst uh, bridgeways in the entire state. It literally was falling apart, and that would have caused many problems if we lost that access. So Joe brings up that point, and I hope you folks can bear with us. And I hope when you see construction, you can bear with us. Because one day, we won't have all of this, but knowing that it's happening shows that we really are listening. The state is listening. And I got to see Mayor Blanche already today, Joe, and I definitely let it know that we still need their support at Honolulu Valley. So thank you guys for being the partners with us. Because, like I said, we cannot do it without you guys. So thank you. We have someone online. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Sam said, I'm going to have to call up first, go first. And then we'll have to go right after this. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Okay. Um, hello, my name is Gandhi Kaho. I'm in 10th grade and I go to Nankuri um, High. And I was just wondering if it's possible to make one of those bridges, like the one in New and stuff like that, to, um, for the kids to cross over the street and stuff like that. So you're talking about pedestrian bridge crossway, right? Yeah. Okay. So I know they just did one in Wahiawa. And so where would you think a pedestrian crossway bridge serve best for the community? Like right across the mall, um, the stoplight, the mall and the Wahiawa and Kamehameha because all the Kamehameha kids are crossing the street to go to school. And all of the non kids are trying to go to the beach and stuff like that. So pedestrian bridge in Kamaiwana? Yeah. Okay. I will work with the OG to see how that would look like for us. You know, at one point, I think we did have a pedestrian bridge in that area, and I don't know what happened. So mm -hmm. I, I could definitely follow up to see how that would look for our community. 
What was your name again? Jackie Hall. And you're in the Yeah. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you again. Off to me. Can I accept it?
So it's not going to happen today, but that is a reality that we have to face. But she talks about the sidewalks, I talk to Jordan about this, they do this in other states where they, in, in lack of better words, they use islands to separate the sidewalks to allow no parking, but also give that barrier so folks aren't blocking the sidewalks to allow people to safely cross. Um, I'm sorry, I'm losing the train of thought. But she brings up a good point on safety and whatnot. And I just want to acknowledge uh, Mr. Powell's. I just sent an email to DOT Highways uh, requesting what we're talking about. So I will let you know how that proceeds. Yeah, and I would also like to mention that uh, last year DOT completed the Farrington Highway Corridor Study. Um, it's something that's going to be like a roadmap for how these projects are rolled out and kind of the, the level of importance for each project on the Wyanai Coast. So if you do have time and you're interested in learning more about our Farrington Highway improvements, that's one place to definitely look to. And also on DOT's website, there's all these different tools you can use to track projects like the My Fellow War Bridge or Maca Bridge Project. You can see how much it costs, what the projected dates are, and who the uh, contractor is to build the road. Uh, so you know also who to contact if you want to report issues, say, with the project. Um, so that's something definitely to look forward to. And then on that same note of studies and plans, uh, the YNI Sustainable Communities Plan is also coming up. I'm meeting with the city next week to talk about community outreach and getting people's input. But this is a very important time for us to put our thoughts onto paper and into a formal study that hopefully can be utilized for generations to come as it has been already since 2010, I think was the 2010 or 2012 was the most recent Minas Sustainable Communities Plan. And in that plan, it shows a lot about what the priorities from our community is and our past Kabuna who have put effort into making sure that their voices was uh, put in this report so that for future leaders like me and Darius, we can always look back onto that and say, you know, this is what the roadmap was in the past. Is there ways that we can improve it? Of course there will be. And is there ways that we can implement some of these ideas that have been on paper for decades? So I'm looking forward to all of these discussions and I really want to thank everyone for being here tonight. You guys really made this event a successful and inform informative life. So how So what we're going to do now is we're going to wrap it up by allowing them two minutes each to just say, you know, their mamalos or whatever other mamalos they want to share. I got the timer on them, so it's going to be two minutes. And after that, we're going to hold hands and sing Hawaii. Oh, we have one more person. Now then we're going to sing Hawaii Aloha and then you can come and take some produce. I don't know how we're going to do that because the boxes are pretty tight. So whoever's strong can open up the boxes. But the different types of vegetables and things. Yes, yeah, so please don't forget, we're going to probably open all of these up. And before you leave, get a bunch for your, uh, your household. Uh, please feel free to take as much as you can because I know we got a, a good amount from um, the white parts. You get one. I want to buy any of the white parts. I want to buy any of the Yes, please go for it. Is that Paul? Hey, thanks for being here, Paul. Mahalo.
saw the need is a need, not a want, is a need. For a public or I would say not only regional part. What I just passed out to them and to some of the individuals that were up here speaking is the same thing that I have. Go ahead and read the document. The document started in 2010. So why not a comprehensive plan for a regional park back in 2010? We are 2022. No park, not yet. So all I'm doing here today is getting the information out so we as a community, not individuals now, can collaborate by using all the words they use. Collaborate, partnership, take care of the Aina. The Aina is the land, because we need the land. Okay. To get this plan, a why not government's a health plan, it's not just a plan, but put the plan into action. And like all of you who came up here and spoke, a lot of things you want to do, a lot of things that got to be done for the community. How many of you have children or grandchildren in here? How many? We all have kids. Well, this regional park is for the kids. It's not for me. It's not for me now. It's not for you either. <laughs> it's for us to have so that our children who come after us can actually see what we do, what we've done as adults in our community. They need to know the legacy of us or what we do for our white life. That's it. transportation and homelessness, but I think it's very important and vital in our community, uh, focusing on the education of our children. And um, some of the curriculums, I know we fought hard for the schools are starting to implement, but if we could just have your guys' participation as well in implementing specific type of structures back in our schools. And if there's any way we could possibly also introduce the bill for, or a bill for school choice uh, for families to have the allocation of money, and not to them, but to the, the school choice that they desire. There is a handful of our, our um, residents here that send their school to private schools because of the lack of um, attention that they're receiving in our public schools. So if we can get more involved in our public schools to increase um, their attention to our children so that we don't have to deter and send our kids to other outside sources or homeschool them. Um, so it's just like collaboratively again, like everybody coming together, but is there any way that we'd be able to introduce something like that for the school choice bill since we're going into session? So just that thought. And then, um, or, um, I forgot my other question, but there was just a lot of like side notes, um, just to help emphasize that city and county has addressed the sidewalk issue in the ministry, um, but it's because of the, far down the list it was when they paved our road, um, and they are going to be putting in the speed pumps, they just sent out notices to homeowners about two months ago. Um, but the last thing was we already have a sustainability a sustainability survey that's out and it's hanging at I believe why not most comprehensive. I just wanted to encourage everybody, whether state is doing surveys or city and county is doing surveys, it's important to everyone as a whole. If us as a community can really participate and hone in on these things, because that's what we're lacking right now is a participation to move us forward um, in everything uh, in our community. Thank you. You know, um, the jetty wall and the water quality there is very, very poor. We have a lot of community members who are getting sick. One is actually 
hospitalized right now, just from stand up paddleboarding in the bay. So, um, if we can address a DOH and fund them, because we can keep asking them to do things, but if they don't have the funding or the tools to do it, they're not capable. And that's why we always gotta go outside, third party. But um, as far as sustainable, like, we gotta continue that testing so that we can take care of the community and for the jetty wall as well. The bar needs funding. They cannot fix the wall. So I just spoke to Ed Underwood and that's what he said. He needs funding. They're gonna do the wall, do the study, we can reach as you already know, I need a partner up with the witch to kind of track the circulation so that we can understand better, is it flowing properly? Um, so that's already in the works, but don't worry, it's money for that. Um, yep. um, I mean, yeah, 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 we're definitely considering a CIP um, on that Jenny Wall issue. Um, and seeing if we can make well, some openings in it, kind of like what you see in that island, maybe um, some of the, you know, to work on it. And I really appreciate what you're doing. I'm happy to work to a Surfrider Foundation on the, the Noah Grant, um, the OAH, you're trying to really track yeah, where the proposed is. So thank you. Thank you. Well, one of the biggest concerns we have uh, is just not in this robot. Is we are special needs kids, you know, kids with special needs. The bullying in the schools has to be controlled. Some kind of bill. I'm a concerned grandmother, mother, auntie, mama. I take care of my nine kids. And some of them have special needs. And just knowing that they're coming home and being bullied, that's unacceptable. You know, so. So that bill needs to be introduced. We have to hold these bullies accountable for the actions. It's a person that talking about the state of Hawaii, the fake corporation bullying on the people. Like just walking around and calling them out. Come on. What they mean? How the state of Hawaii treats the parents come out need to also know what's going on. They still cannot be hiding, hindering these things. They've been doing it. Couple may just had this petition, big petition. Why not have a bully? The parents do not know about it, but the kids nowadays has iPhone and they put them on Facebook or Instagram. So the parents, the bully, the one that's been bullied, the parents don't know. But the character don't know. But everybody on Instagram and Facebook know before they do. We got to go. And the school do not inform them. The school do not call them. Because the school is hindering things. That's unacceptable behavior. Unethical behavior on the Department of Education. We need it to put it out there. Stop hiding things. Because they have a, they don't have a voice. But as long as they have people with a heart for their special needs. I'll be part of that voice. So please introduce a bill. What a scene you are Thank you, Andrew, for bringing up the, the issues that we're facing. So a bill idea that was floated, and I don't, I, I, I won't debate it in a sense of time. I'm not committing to it, but what DOE constantly faces is the jurisdiction of their property, right? Because what happens off campus is not in their jurisdiction. I'm not committing to this, but if you both just give a thumbs up, thumbs down, the idea would be to extend DOE property within a quarter mile radius that anything that happens outside of the quarter, within the quarter mile is still considered action that the schools can take. Is that something that you both think? Is that a yes, a thumbs up, a thumbs down? Is that something that TIC or Facebook can talk more about it? But it's in the it's in the, re the response, right? Because what's happening to our people. See, we can talk about it more. I'm not committing to it, but it's an idea that's been floated because they don't have that jurisdiction. So I, I will explore it more. I don't want to commit to it just yet. But know that it was an idea that came up out of the couple situation. So I'm not committing to it. 
So I will follow up more daily talks for you. I think I'll have to post it as well. I'm glad to kind of get a good jurisdiction. Auntie Georgie is the last speaker.
What you guys can get. Yes. Food for everybody. You can see tomatoes, papayas, bananas. Good stuff. You get dinner and dessert here. Don't forget to plant the bananas. <laughs> plant the papayas. So we got papayas here. Amazon. The best buy, best buy socks. Everything. Quality is low, but this easy is portable. How much cost you for that setup? This one costs the most. Mm. The, the, the Mike Shotgun. Mm. This is like a 20, 20 30 dollar frame. Depends if you got iPhone or Android. The size matters. Tripod, cheap tripod, but the audio is the main thing. Yeah. Yeah. Depending what you're using, cell phone or the jumbo cameras. You should take a box. You should take the whole box, Darius. No, no, no. <laughs> we got tomatoes here. Can you see? So, yeah. Okay. So we're gonna take some tomatoes. I'm gonna show you guys live. I cannot carry it all, but I'm gonna show you guys. 
We got banana, tomatoes. We got the whole community here. We got everybody around. This is the setup you guys can see. Since we did this last time, we put the papaya and tomatoes. Great job, our moderator. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Take care. Yeah, yeah. Make sure you take care. Yeah. yeah, we're going to show everybody. We have to go grab bananas now. Take some more, Auntie. Take some more. More bananas. You can see. Apple bananas from Sugarland. I don't know. I don't know if we're going to carry all of this. Alright, we're gonna manage. I'm not sure how much papayas are in the store, but once you plant papaya seeds, you'll get more papayas. Alright, Auntie knows. Alright, so we're gonna go get our papaya on. I love what you do. I don't have uh, uh, Tiana Wilbur to get touch with you. Yeah, she knows me. Yeah. We'll talk story so, off, off grid. Yeah, off yeah, the grid. Off the grid. Because we're going to have to take care of old school. Because they don't listen to the pala pala. Yeah, so we're going <laughs> to stack this up. I'm going to show you guys. So we're going to say thank you for whoever donated all this wonderful fruit. And you are surely, it's 100% going to plant the tomato seeds and the pie seeds. You can see we're closing up now for this wonderful event. Our different representatives. And uh, let me close this out with you guys here. So thank you all for watching. We didn't get to say everything we want to say about human trafficking and drug smuggling. It's two minutes too short, and I would say I talk too fast, and they listen too slow, and they cannot write the notes down quick enough. So I'm just going to email them all, and I'll do another post for all you guys live, and you guys can see it later. So hearts, we got to catch them all. Pikachu loves you, and you know I'm going to 86, and you will do good. Yeah, you. Yeah.